Good afternoon. It's January 31st and it's time for the monthly PowerPoint. And this time I'm going to do it off of Zoom and uh, copy it onto YouTube. So uh, we're going to cover the most frequently cited serious standards in general industry. And this is uh, something I used to do every year and I, I hadn't done it in a couple of years. So we'll go through. I'm John Newquist. I used to work for OSHA and we'll talk about it. The first one, of course, no written hazard communication program. It's number one cited because everybody seems to have to have it, whether it's construction, a warehouse, factory. And so if they go out there and they get complaints and they come out, they'll ask you for this. And if you don't have it, you're going to get it. But you have to have a list of hazardous chemicals. And I also put down how many citations issued in the calendar year 2022. Number two on the list, machine guarding. Wow. That's up there now. That's amazing. You know, when you look at construction, it's all false. But, you know, what you're looking for is on a conveyor. You want pull cords or emergency stops. So if you get caught in a roller conveyor, you can sit there and shut it off and not get killed. Uh, printing presses need guards. Most of them have interlock guards, which are good. You can sit there and have light curtains like this over here. But you need to have your machines guarded. You should not be able to get caught in the machines. I mean, we had a guy that uh, died in Alabama this week alone, and he had duct tape holding the guard on. What a, what a nonsense thing that is. And then number three, you got to train people in the answers of the chemicals. they got to know kind of a little bit about the chemical, what's going to happen, what kind of PPE do you have to wear. You know, if you got uh, bleach and it's an irritant, you do probably want to wear some eye protection. you got a corrosive, you're going to need something for preventing it coming into your eyes like goggles and gloves and stuff that doesn't get your bare skin corroded you know that's very bad and if it's a corrosive you must you must have an eye wash within 55 feet or 10 seconds by the industry standard so that's something I see often missing and it's, it's jumping around you know because I, I want to use my down arrow and it doesn't want to use it I have to use the mouse which is very sensitive Lockout procedures. Well, I was go I'm going to go to a place tomorrow, and they've got five facilities across Illinois, and I asked them, by the way, we're going to talk about lockout. Can you give me an example of your procedures so we can talk about it tomorrow? And he sat there and like, huh? I says, you got all these machines. Don't you have a procedure for each machine? No, John, we don't. we got hundreds of employees. Brand new safety person. Wow, this is going to be a lot of writing for him. But you need to go. Brady makes a lot of lockout software, so people, you know, it's find it very easy. You can use Excel. You can do anything else. But you got to have a procedure for all your machines. I worked with one company uh, in Illinois, and they had 40 machines, and OSHA had stopped to do hearing conservation uh, or noise inspection. And I says, you got to get all your procedures in lockout. And he's like, oh, it's going to take forever. I says, not really. You, I can show you how to guard all the machines. We can get each one of them, have your manager rob it sit there and hop on these procedures. We'll show you how to develop them. And when OSHA came back, they're like, wow, this, this little company did a great job. And that's they ended up getting no citations, which is good. Number five, you got to have forklift people trained. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've seen get hurt where people take an online class and nobody watches them. It's got to be a classroom and it's got to be a practical. When I was driving this forklift, here, double stack boxes come up to the line and drop the pallet exactly within an inch of the line. Well, that's a tough test because you hit the brakes, they're all going to go. You know, I would never do this in an industry. I would, I would just carry one level high. And if I'm going to carry up more, I'm going to band it up with plastic or something. I'm not going to have these things start to fall over and spill paint or whatever else it is. But uh, you have to recertify after three years. You have to have some kind of refresher training. Oh, come on. There we are. Let's get back to number six. Number six. Oh, my God. i got to figure a better way to advance it. You know what? i got a clicker I'll have to use next time. Medical evaluation. That means when you're going to require them to wear a respirator, then you have to have them do a medical evaluation. And they'll give them a form that looks like this, the medical evaluation form. It's going to have, have you had seizures, diabetic, allergic reactions for interfering with your hip breathing, etc. And the medical professional is going to evaluate that. And some of them will listen to your lungs and say, you know what, we might need to do a chest x-ray. I'm hearing wheezing or something else. And this is the number one respirator cited. Programs are up there, but this is something you got to have. And you also have to do a fit test 
I'm seeing a lot of people not doing any respirator fit tests, which is no good. User seal check, not a fit test. You're going to put the hood on, you're going to do Bitrex, saccharin, corn oil, irritant smoke, or um, banana oil. And the fit test is annually. This is what the hood looks like. You know, these things can be expensive. You know, I use a nebulizer. I, I buy a, one from Walmart called the Nest. It's like 40 bucks. Battery operated. You fill it up with like saccharin or Bitrix and it's good. I don't like Bitrix because I get it on my hands and then, you know, you eat. And if you don't wash it real good, you you get the bitter taste. But the hood is, is a pain in the tail. I mean, you know, if it's summer and people sweat, I mean, I'll, I'll look like I'm in a steam bath when I'm doing this. So you just got to do it. It is required to be done. And I show people a lot of times how to do this. You got to do lockout training. Um, to everybody who's authorized to use a lock. That means they have a lock. They got to have some kind of training somewhere. It is such a big deal and such a source of injuries. Most of the companies I work with, we do it every year. Every year we cover lockout because it's that important. But you have to have it. And OSHA will come out to you and say, who are authorized employees to lock out at your facility? And you'll give them the maintenance people, but you forget the cleaning people often lock out. They're cleaning food mixers, they're cleaning conveyors, they're cleaning anything. And if they got a lock, they're authorized. And you have to have them trained. And, and it's not a, a symptom where they got to be careful. You got to make sure you do a periodic inspection every year with them. You got to go out and have them as a trained employee, and you have to have a written lockout program. So there's a lot of things to do in lockout. By the way, I got a book on lockout too if you want to be interested in reading it. Um, and this panel one, oh my God. You know, when I was in the field, it was like number nine for me. But now the OSHA people, they're going after it. That panel's blocked by a pallet, piece of equipment, everything you can imagine you can put in front of a panel box in the factory or other facilities. Wow. They're coming in there because it's, it's like whatever reason, OSHA loves it because how are you going to lose a case if the pallet's blocking it? I can't get to the panel because I got a machine in front of it. I got a table in front of it. I've got all this crap in front of it. That is not good. So they are picking this up and you have to be conscious of it. So when I do train, you know, a lot of auditors and stuff, this isn't one that you can easily get. You can mark things on the floor, but it just takes diligence. You have to watch on this one because somebody sees the space, they say, oh, I can just put the pallet right here, not realizing they're blocking a panel. And then number 10, we got, uh, oops, the eyewash. Squirt bottles, no good. You got corrosives, you're going to have an eyewash. You can buy these portable ones, they'll give you 15 minutes of flush, but you have to have it. You know, if you got these portable ones, change the water every month. You, know, you don't want water that's been there 10 years. But these are what you're going to have to have. And hopefully, if you designed it right, you got a drain down here so it'll go into a drain, not spread out all over the floor and make everybody slip and slide and everything else. So this one is uh, something they look at, and, and it's, it applies to construction just as well as industry. What's under the top 10? Well, point of operation guarding. Just like the other standard, it's just requiring guarding of machines, except the point of operation where cutting, forming, uh, shaping of the stock is being done. Over four feet, you have to have some kind of fall protection, and you're exposed on a roof within 15 feet. So Goose Island Brewery, they looked at it, we talked about it, they just put portable guardrails up. 42 inches high, counterweighted plates, each one of these little guardrail systems cost about 400 bucks, and they're done. They don't have to worry about it. The parapet will hold it in there, you won't have anybody fall. But that's something else. Remember, falls from roofs are number two cause of falls all over. Most of them are in construction. But if you're up on a roof, you can fall if you're right at the edge and you're considered exposed at 15 feet. The periodic inspection for lockout, that means every authorized person, you should have every one of them had an audit back in 2022. I do groups of five and ten. We just lock out one machine. We document it, make sure they're doing it right, and uh, have it on the record. I take photos. Every time you do this, take photos because you want to show somebody that it was done because, you know, sometimes the OSHA person will ask, the, you know, have you had a periodic inspection under the the lockout tagout standard, and they'll be sitting there like, I have no idea what the OSHA person said, but I'll say no. And so we, you know, when we talk, you know, they're going to go talk to OSHA. Well, I says, did you have the periodic inspection? You remember when Pablo went there and did the audit with you? That's called a periodic inspection. They're going to ask you about it. Do you remember it? Oh, yeah, I remember it. Good, because it makes it easier. It makes, it, you know, the inspection go a lot easier. 
uh, written respirator program. Remember, you're requiring to wear it. You're going to have a written respirator program. You got a box of respirators that you said, hey, N95s, you can use them if you want. You still got to train them in what they call 1910-134 Appendix D. And then you got to have an SDS for every chemical. I don't think uh, anybody can comply with this if you don't do a vigilant job. You got to do this audit every year to find these stuff because people bring in stuff. So in our place in Illinois that had the, uh, you know, we had a right lockout and hazard communication. You know, Robin went through and I says, okay, first we'll get rid of all the old stuff you ain't used in 10 years. You don't need it anyway. Get rid of it. Take it to the incinerator in the town and, you know, they'll dispose of it. So we had 125 and then the OSHA person goes over there and says, well, give me the data sheets for these five chemicals. And you guess what? They couldn't find one of them. She did 124, but she missed the one because they might have moved it on or who knows. And, you know, they thought about it. And, they, you know, they did the closing conference. They said, well, we're probably going to cite you for the missing data sheet. And they said, you know what? Nah. This employer really tried to do everything right, and they just missed one. And we'll give it to them. We'll give them a break. Because by the time, um, you know, she had told it, I says, well, go get the data sheet, email it to OSHA, and maybe they won't cite. And they didn't cite. They could have done it. They would have been well within their rights. They used some discretion. I want to say it's a little nicer, you know, for some of the OSHA offices and stuff. So you can do this. And then, you know, like I said, I just got the STSC today, so thank you. It's I, I want to get eventually a lot of these other ones in there. So uh, thank you very much for listening to my uh, talk about Most Frequently Cited. This is a new thing I'm going to do, and we're going to have uh, one hopefully every month. Thank you very much. John Newquist signing off.